The following is a local resident producer's program. The program content is the sole responsibility of the producer and does not necessarily reflect the views or policies of CATV2, Oshkosh Community Media Services, the City of Oshkosh, or Time Warner Cable. Hi everyone, welcome to Ian Oshkosh here along with Dan Rylance and uh, we're very pleased to welcome back uh, an old friend to the show, uh, Winnebago County District Attorney uh, Christian Gossett and uh, want to talk about a few things tonight. Uh, first of all, welcome back. Yeah, welcome back. Thank, Thank you very nice much. Nice to have yeah. you. Um, want to talk uh, about a few things, as I mentioned. First of all, um, you know, the, the budget, and then we want to talk about some specifics within the budget, um, some things that were kind of attached to the budget. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's the most polite way of putting it. Uh, and, and then you guys have a relatively new website. We want to touch on that a little bit. and. Um, you know, talk about early release and stuff like that. So I guess, you know, first and foremost, as we're taping this on the 2nd of July, the budget was just signed earlier this week by Governor Doyle. Um, how does it impact our district attorney's office here in Winnebago County? Uh, well, we were spared the 5% uh, across the board cut that most agencies mm -hmm. received, um, which is very good. Uh, right now in the state of Wisconsin, I believe we have approximately 424 prosecutors. Um, the last Legislative Audit Bureau report indicated we were between 117 and 132 prosecutors short. So there was a request for an additional 117 prosecutor positions. Um, we did not get any of those. Uh, we lost a total of three and a quarter attorney positions in the state of Wisconsin. Um, and the attorneys in our office have not received raises in three years. Um, it appears they may not get raises for two more years. Um, and we have the 1% reduction where I believe that's going to be covered by turnover, um, just attrition, things of that sort. And then we have a 2.5% cut that we have to account for. And it appears that what they're going to do is require a furlough of eight days in each cycle, um, the net result of which is uh, really a 3% pay cut um, to the attorneys. Uh, the bigger problem for us is we have ten attorneys in our office, nine of whom would be subject to eight-day furloughs, uh, so we're losing prosecutors for over two months um, each year, I guess, um, and that's going to make it even more challenging. Sure. So. It, it, do you have some sense, and I know this is a brand new thing and it's not mm. happened yet, but do you have some sense of how that furlough in particular may impact caseload? You know, the attorneys in our office, I, I'm very, very confident. They're all professionals. They do what they do because they're dedicated to mm -hmm. it. Um, and uh, we'll make sure that it works. Uh, there, I can guarantee the community is not going to see any negative um, fallout from this. We'll make it work for everybody. Okay, good. Question just a minute, follow up. The 3.5 lost positions, were those new positions you didn't get? or? Uh, no, those were, and these are statewide numbers, the three and a quarter positions were federally funded um, positions through grant money where okay. that grant money uh, s ceased to exist okay. and the state didn't pick up the okay. cost of those positions. Okay, thank you. Certainly. Now, now the, um, the state attorney general's office, I know before the budget was signed, they, they were saying that there were some proposed cuts that were going to really impact them quite a bit and it, it wasn't quite that bad when the budget finally got signed, but how does whatever cut they got hit with in their office, how does that trickle down <coughs> or does it and affect uh, us? Uh, yeah, it, it certainly does. Uh, the Attorney General's Office for the state has a lot of mandatory duties that uh, they have to perform. And then they also have discretionary duties. So whenever they start losing positions, they start losing funding, it's the discretionary responsibilities of the Attorney General's Office that are going to suffer. Um, one of the biggest impacts for DA's offices throughout the state, uh, if you keep in mind that there's 71 DA's offices in the state of Wisconsin, um, there's 72 counties 
counties, but Shawano and Menominee County share one DA. Um, so there's 71 DA's offices. Some of these are one and two attorney offices. And in the last few years, uh, we've had some very high profile right. shootings and things of that sort. Um, you know, if you're a district attorney in a small county and you handle everything from underage drinking, operating after revocation, to rapes, I mean, you have a full plate. And if all of a sudden you have a big homicide case, as, uh, as, Brandon, huh? yep, as yeah. we've seen in several of our uh, counties throughout the last couple of years, uh, I'm not sure that the general public always understands that's the attorney general's office that comes to their aid. Mm -hmm. um, even Stephen Avery, um, mm -hmm. the attorney general's office was there the entire time. They helped litigate the case. They provided a lot of expertise. Um, and uh, to assist DA's offices, I believe they really only have seven criminal litigation attorneys out there. and they they try to prioritize as best they can, uh, but we just recently did that Zachary Reed homicide case here mm -hmm. in Winnebago County. The Attorney General's office was involved in that case behind the scenes, mm -hmm. um, but that's part of what they do with their discretionary funds is they assist um, all of these other counties, and even in Winnebago County where you know we have a population approaching 165,000 people, um, first degree intentional homicide cases we used to not see at all. Uh, you know, we'd see them sporadically here and there. Um, but we, we had uh, three pending. In fact, we still have that one pending. So we still have three first degree intentional homicide cases pending simultaneously. Uh, that takes a lot, a lot of resources. Um, one of those cases every three years would seriously challenge our resources. Having three of them pending at the same time is very, very difficult. And the Attorney General's office is always there for us as soon as we need something, if we need expertise in an area. Um, our child pornography case. You know, we don't have, uh, I guess, available to us in Winnebago County very many computer forensic um, professionals. I think we have one, and that's with one department, so we can loan them out, but the amount of cases that we're dealing with are so great that we always fall back to the Department of Justice, um, and they will send people. They will get experts to testify about how this gets put on a computer. Um, you know, inevitably somebody with child pornography on their computer wants to talk about how a virus must have gotten on their computer and downloaded <laughs> child pornography. Uh -huh. Well, it, it sounds ridiculous, but uh, you know they'll get up and say it, and we have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that that didn't happen. Uh, we turn to DCI, mm -hmm. uh, the Division of Criminal Investigation for the Department of Justice, and they send those experts to us. It doesn't cost Winnebago County anything, so we get all of this expert testimony for free. If the state doesn't provide those services, we have to contractually do that. You know, through private companies, it costs a lot more money. Um, because now you're paying, you know, $150, $250 sure. fees per hour plus travel time, and that goes to the county taxpayers. Mm -hmm. uh, because uh, my operating budget, aside from the attorneys and our computers, comes from the county. So now all of a sudden, uh, the cost is much greater, mm -hmm. and it's localized. Yeah. So. Well, the taxpayer ends up getting it in the shorts, no matter which way you look at this. I mean, yeah. you, you can institute fees, the taxpayer still pays them. Yeah. You know, you can not raise taxes on a state level or keep them at a minimum on a state level. We end up taking the brunt of it in the shorts on a local level, you know. Yeah. So it, it's all just, you know, it's the money's in one pocket or it's in another pocket or it comes out of one pocket or another, you know. It's, yeah. Yeah. We're taking it and, and we're taking the brunt of it no matter what. Yeah. So. yeah, but having that distribution throughout the state and having people who are just simply experts in those areas, they're very, very good, they're very, mm -hmm. very quick, um, and because they're employed by the state as opposed to a private company in Texas, um, they're readily available and they're even very accessible, you know, just for information, calling and saying, this is what they're claiming, is that feasible? No, this is why. Thank you. Uh, most of what the Attorney General's office does for our office is really just giving us legal advice. Um, you know, they do most of our felony appellate work, and so they have all of these briefs. They have an entire brief bank at the Attorney General's office. So instead of spending three days researching and writing a brief, we can get access to their information and have a brief knocked out in a couple hours or a half a day. Well, you know, when you, when you talk about things like computer mm -hmm. forensics and stuff like that, if you're getting assistance from the state AG's office, uh, do they come in to the courtroom then at trial and testify like in an expert capacity? Yep. So you may be losing that. You may have to right. pay expert fees then, exactly. which is even 
more expense yep. than what we've been talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's what I was getting at. In fact, we just uh, had a jury conviction, I believe it was on 43 or 47 counts of child pornography mm -hmm. on a computer. Uh, the state sent us an expert and uh, you know, it didn't cost us anything in Winnebago County, but the expert, because they work for the state, they were also willing to take the phone calls uh, from the prosecutor. They're not starting a stopwatch. Um, mm -hmm. And even on uh, the Reed trial, I think it was Sunday night before the trial started, I needed some additional information. Uh, yeah, the people at the Attorney General's office are just as dedicated to the cause as we are. But we can contact quite a few of them at home on their personal cell phones, got a hold of them, they logged into their system remotely, got me the information I needed, and I had it within 15 minutes. Hmm. Um, you're certainly not going to get that from a private company. No. <laughs> so. no and if you do, it's going to come with a huge price. Yeah, yeah, they yeah, we're going to be paying double time, if not more, for yeah. the uh, Sunday phone calls. Yeah. So it, it's very important what they do and the support that they give. Um, you know, they do so much behind the scenes that I think it makes it hard when they try to explain that to the general public because they don't always see what they're oh, doing, sure. but they really are very instrumental. Sure. There were a couple of things that Dan and I had on our list of things to talk about that were kind of attached to or buried in uh, the budget. <laughs> and the first one, of course, is early release. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, you know, what happened with that and, and what that means to the general public? Sure. Um, early release is, uh, there's so many different ways to look at it. Um, I've publicly argued against this um, since its inception, uh, but not necessarily, uh, you know, I've in turn just been labeled as you know, a typical prosecutor. <laughs> um, but I think the general public didn't really understand it entirely um, because the proposal was put out as if we give inmates some incentive, um, you know, good behavior, do all the rehabilitative efforts, then we'll give them up to a third of their time off. Uh, Okay, I'm fine with that. Um, in fact, before this, there were already systems in place where they could get 15 or 25 percent of their time off for good behavior. Uh, the biggest change that that brought about, and what I was most opposed to, is they took the discretion away from the judge. And they put it in an earned release program board, which is just a parole board mm -hmm. uh, with a new name. And by doing that, they took away all accountability. So they could have very easily said, we'll give them up to a third of their time off. All they have to do is complete these programs, then we'll send it back to the judge, let the judge have a hearing, and make a decision. And the reason that that was so important to me is the old process required that the person petition the court, the court notify the district attorney's office. We, in turn, had to notify the victim and get input from the victim if they wanted to have input on it. Okay. So that when we went to court, either the victim could come and address the court and talk about the impact the crime had on them, how they're doing, um, how they feel about it, mm -hmm. and the court could take that into consideration. Another factor is, you know, we have some people that just, no matter what we do, they are not going to follow the law, uh, but the problem with putting people through the criminal justice system is they get a little bit better each time and it gets a little bit harder to catch them. And you know, right now we're, we're dealing with a gang issue that is just spiraling out of control. Mm -hmm. And you know, gangs aren't what people used to think of gangs. You, know, you don't even know who most gang members are by sight anymore. Um, so they're getting more organized and more sophisticated. So they may be involved in all sorts of criminal enterprises. We get them a couple times. And if we were to go in front of a judge and explain, judge, in this case, they were on the periphery, they were on the periphery here, you know, they were, they were right on the edge on 17 burglaries. We finally got them on two. We understand they completed their rehabilitation, but while this person only shows two burglary convictions, here's the reports from these other 17 or so cases where, boy, their involvement sure looks like it's, it's sort of there. And so, you know, we used to be able to go to a judge and say that. This earned release program board they're not going to talk to us. They're not going to talk to the victims. No. And if the community's outraged, um, you know, right now OWIs are a huge discussion sure. point with the general yep. public. Well, OWI homicides, that's one of the cases where you can get early release up to a third of your sentence off. <laughs> victims' family's never even going to know it's coming. They're going to have no yeah. input on it. Um, mm -hmm. you know, and we, we lose the opportunity to go uh, state our position, for the victim to go state their position. And if the Earned Release Program Board lets them out, who do you blame? Yeah. Um, you know, yeah. as a voter, 
who do you go vote out of office? Um, uh, you know, I'm a prosecutor. I can't tell you anybody on the Earned Release Program Board. Um, I, I suspect you guys don't know either. No. Um, you know, but these are the people who get to make these decisions. And my fear is, because there was an attempt to put in judicial review, and that was taken back out, is my understanding. And my fear, and I suspect what's going to happen, I think we're going to see it happen, is this is going to become budget driven. My question was, is this driven by budget? Exactly. Yeah. And, and that's, uh, that's my suspicion on why they don't want judicial review. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think it's just going to operate backwards. You know, we have 21,000 people in prison. Well, by 2011, now we want 18,000 people in prison. So you people on the Earned Release Program Board, you figure out which 3,000 people are rehabilitated. And uh, so it's going to be the cart driving the horse. Are there certain criminals that are not involved in early? Are there certain categories? Uh, there are certain categories, okay. correct. So which ones, give a, examples of a couple that would be eligible for early um, And I actually did run through, and I tried to highlight um, some that would stick out to people. Uh, homicide by intoxicated use of a motor vehicle, they are eligible for early release. Um, uh, all the manufacturing, delivering of drugs, um, it's all early release. Um, uh, fleeing, eluding an officer, uh, resulting in the death of another person. So you're in your car, you run from the police, you run through a group of school kids, kill three of them, you're eligible for early release. Um, uh, hit and run causing great bodily harm, early release. Robbery, early release. Those seem to be the ones that should not be. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Uh, you know, burglary. Um, OWI with 10 or more prior convictions. Um, That's almost outrageous, uh, really, well, Christian. Oh, and I can keep going. Yeah. People are outraged, as you, I'm sure, well yes. know, about <laughs> drunken driving and uh, the repeat. We, we were, we were promised as a community, <laughs> you know, those of us in the state of Wisconsin, we were promised that they were going to get tough on drunk driving. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, you know, we have this case pending where a 14-year-old competitive skater was killed by a drunk driver. This law just took that maximum penalty for that person from 15 years of confinement to 10 years of confinement. I mean, that's mm -hmm. absolutely absurd. I mean, that is a slap in the face of anybody who thinks drunk driving is a bad thing. Okay, I'm going to go the other way just for a sec. Minnesota and Wisconsin have basically the same population, both yep. over 5 million. Yep. Wisconsin has twice <coughs> as many people incarcerated yes. as Minnesota. Um, you know, if you're a taxpayer, I mean, the, the safety issue and, and the ones you've listed for early release really upset me. But, you know, at some point, how many can we afford to yep. have in prison? Absolutely. <coughs> and Minnesota takes a very different approach. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know what Minnesota spends on corrections. Okay. I have been told, but I have not verified that it's similar to what Wisconsin spends. The difference is Minnesota is very intensive on their probation. Um, uh, you know, right now in Wisconsin, uh, you know, in Winnebago County, when we get people and convict them of possession of cocaine, possession of marijuana, things of that sort, uh, we don't even put them on probation anymore because there aren't enough probation agents. <laughs> So we found out that they're not putting them in treatment anyway mm -hmm. because they can't. They, they're monitoring all of our sex offenders and things like that. They don't have time for that. So in Wisconsin, the Department of Corrections, in, in their smart on crime approach, if you want treatment for your drug problem, you have to wait till it becomes so bad that you're dealing drugs and you end up in prison, you're robbing businesses and you end up in prison, or you're burglarizing homes and you're ending up in prison. Once you're in prison, we will get you some treatment. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, it's okay. by virtue of how we do it. We refuse to spend the money up front. Um, you know, and you can even see it with the prosecution crisis that we've had in this state since 2003. They refuse to address it. Well, they refuse to address it because they've created a bottleneck at the level of prosecution in the hopes that fewer people will end up in prison. Well, I'm an elected official. I'm accountable to all of the people in Winnebago County. Uh, what am I not going to prosecute? You know, the possession of drug paraphernalia or the sexual assault of a child. Everybody who's going to prison is going to be prosecuted. Our felony caseload has gone from a low of 453 to a high of 1,076. Our misdemeanor caseload has gone from over 2,900 to under 2,000. 
the more serious crimes being committed, the fewer less serious crimes that are being yeah, committed. Interesting. And uh, you may have seen uh, sometime within the last six months, uh, the Northwestern here did an article about the forfeitures went through the roof, right. and that's at our request because we're so far understaffed that uh, we have to get the serious offenders off the streets. Uh, another uh, law, criminals sure. up to the age of 25 instead of 21 could have their records expunged if they met certain criteria. What's the significance of this? Um, well, the significance is it increases the age that expungement can be available, okay. and it also ex it also increases the type or the classifications of crimes that they can be eligible for expungement okay. on. Uh, the nice thing is that that's discretionary. Okay. So um, with with a judge. With a judge. Okay. Yeah. Unlike. This. Unlike that, yeah. Okay. Um, and so I, I don't, I'm not really opposed to that yeah. law. I, I want to see how it's going to kind of pan out. Okay. Um, but sometimes there are situations where you really don't want a conviction to stick with a young person yeah. in particular for the rest of their life. Um, and so that gives us a little more discretion to make arguments to the okay. court for those. And it, it, quite honestly, what it does is it, it really kind of codifies something that we've been doing anyway. Okay. We haven't been, you know, illegally granting expungements, but we've been doing deferreds. Um, you know, we'll do plea to a felony, we'll put you on a deferred agreement, and plea to a misdemeanor, which will just stay on your record, and then we'll monitor the person for three or four years, make sure that they get everything straightened out. So we've sort of informally been doing Do that. that. Anyway. Um, yeah, and it, it's a problem even for prosecutors and judges when you have a young person who did something really stupid, yeah. um, but not so stupid that it's not irreversible. Uh, you know, they can still make amends. They can yeah. still straighten out their lives. So you think that's probably a good idea? Yeah, so I, I don't have a problem with that. I'm curious to see how it's going to play sure. out, and I'm sure every county will uh, be a little bit different, but uh, there legitimately are times where I think that, that that's a good thing. Okay. So. Um, you know, we've spent some time here, uh, not a lot, but a little, talking about drunken driving and repeat offenders and that kind of thing. There is a, a proposal that's uh, been floated. Um, to make it uh, state law that um, interlock ignition, or is it I ignition interlock? Ignition I, interlock okay, device. Okay, there we go. I, I, I figured I'd get it right on one of those tries. Um, you know, be required to be installed in the vehicles of, of some of these offenders. Uh, in fact, one of the people proposing this is Dick Spanbauer from mm. the 53rd Assembly District. Um, although, you know, he's, he's a little um, concerned now because his proposal may not be quite the gem I think that he thought it was um, because it may not be a deterrent to drunken driving and um, you know there are all kinds of ways that people can get around this but you have also said um, <laughs> that um, I and this was I in the story in the Northwestern uh, a month ago um, requiring more people to install the device which requires a breath analysis before the vehicle can start does not mean roadways will automatically be safer. Um, and I assume by that you were probably talking about some of the ways that people can get around this. Sure. Well, it, and uh, I'm sorry. No, 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 no okay. okay. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the ignition interlock devices work if you can trust that criminals will you properly utilize them. Um, you know, uh, drunk driving cuts across all socioeconomic statuses. Um, I prosecuted a case, boy, back in 2002, 2003. It was an OWI where the guy had his son in the vehicle. I think he was somewhere around 10, 12 years old. Um, and he took his son to the bar with him because he had the ignition interlock device in his vehicle and so he needed a sober person to blow into it so he could start his car. Um, so I'm not sure that the end result in that yeah. particular case, I've, I've only seen that once in my career. So uh, that's not an epidemic, that's not a problem. Um, however, uh, when you get convicted of OWI, you're not eligible for a license right away. Um, on a first offense, you oftentimes are, but second or subsequent, within five years, you have a one-year wait before you can get a license. And you can't get an ignition interlock device put on your car until you have a license. <laughs> so, and really, from a criminal's perspective, why would you? You're right. driving with a revoked license, and that's what the penalty is mm -hmm. for not having the ignition interlock device mm -hmm. on. So it's operating after revocation or operating after revocation either way. Why pay the fee mm -hmm. to end up in the same, uh, res same situation? Mm -hmm. So uh, these repeat drunk drivers aren't going to be eligible. They're not going to be able to get them for a year. However, they're, oftentimes they still have jobs. Um, uh, so they drive. Um, and it's interesting, I, I did uh, pull the assembly bill here to take a look at it, and they even note in here, approximately 75% of drivers whose licenses are suspended continue to drive. Okay. 
so if they don't get the ignition interlock device, because you're also only required to have the ignition interlock device if you're going to drive. <laughs> so you just get your license and say, I'm not going to drive, I just want it. <laughs> now you don't need the ignition interlock device and you continue to drive. Yeah. Um, or many of these people are involved in relationships, so when they're going to go out to the bar, they take their wife's car or their girlfriend's car. They're not driving their own car because they know they're going to drink alcohol <laughs> and they have an ignition interlock device on. So, you know, yeah. So yeah. if we could rely on you know criminals yeah. not engaging in criminal activity, which I don't think we can, um, uh, then they're great because they will keep you from starting your vehicle well. if you've been drinking, but only if you decide to use them. And we could say, let's get tougher on, on these uh, repeat offenders, but hey, they're eligible for early release. Exactly. So, <laughs> I mean, you know, we're just going round and round in, yes. a, in a maze here, in a big yeah. circle. Uh, I have a couple of general questions. Uh, sure. What makes a good prosecutor? What makes a good prosecutor? Mm -hmm. um, a good prosecutor, well, what I usually tell people is they have to have a little ADHD and OCD. <laughs> um, and, and I think that that's pretty accurate. You have to be able to jump all over the board. Um, you know, but I also tell people we don't have to be rocket scientists. Mm -hmm. um, what we need in prosecutors is we need people that are reasonable, mm -hmm. um, have some life experience. Um, you know, sometimes we come across prosecutors who have gotten in a couple tussles with the law themselves, and that's okay. Um, we don't want the scholars. We want the people who, you know, really can relate to everybody and empathize and sympathize with them. Because prosecution isn't, uh, regardless of what other people uh, may say about it, it's really not about just getting convictions. Mm -hmm. It's about problem solving, yeah. relating to people. My question was prompted by an interview on NPR with Robert Morgenthau, the old longtime district attorney of Manhattan. Okay. You know what his, what his, his answer was? What? Patience. Uh, no. We, we've taken patience out. Um, <laughs> okay. We're, we're, yeah, we're, we're staffed to handle 4,080 cases. And we, so patience uh, doesn't yeah. work. No more patience. Okay. Yep. Well, it's a difference no. between New York and Yeah, and exactly. And New Oshkosh. York, everything's slow and laid back. And <laughs> here in Oshkosh, you know, we are a fast-paced, high-pressure community. I love it. Um, yeah. No, we, uh, really, when we interview people, um, you know, we really try to feel out the person. Yeah, yeah. Um, and uh, we've turned down several people that on paper look phenomenal, but when we're talking to them, you know, if you can't walk in and talk to everybody uh -huh. in a normal conversational way, no matter what their socioeconomic status is, um, and I mean have a meaningful conversation uh -huh. with them, you have no business being a prosecutor. Okay, You're ending near your first term? Uh, no, I'm in my second term. Oh, you're in your second term. Yep. When, when, when is re-election? Another two years? Uh, three and a half, I oh, think. Oh, so you're just starting your second term. Just starting the second term, okay. correct. I'm not going to ask you that question. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I was going to ask you, you're going to run again, but oh. obviously you've just run again. So that's yeah. That's stupid. Uh, you know, <laughs> every day, uh, at least once or twice during the day, I stop and go, why do I do this? I understand. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I absolutely love this. Yeah. Uh, you seem I very comfortable with it. I, I, huh? I love what I do. Yeah. Um, Are you more of an administrator than a prosecutor? I mean, all these I things. I have become. Yeah. And, um, you know, the, the one difference between me and I, I think uh, my predecessor is, is I do make sure I get into court. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, this morning I covered uh, one of our branch calendars in the morning, then I had a uh, juvenile in custody, then I had juvenile hearings in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, you know, and I don't spend all day every day in court, uh, but we have morning and afternoon court calendars, uh -huh. and I typically try to cover at least three or four per week, okay. um, uh, just because I'd go insane sure. if everything I did was administration, sharp, sure. but, um, and actually administration isn't, uh, that might not be the best description of what I do. Um, I do a lot of program development, and um, uh, one of the things that I really tried to do when I took over this office was I wanted to get law enforcement and the DA's office working together with probation and parole, um, the Department of Human Services, and, and let's start finding solutions. <coughs> So we've had uh, several meetings throughout the county over the last three or so years where what we're talking about is what are the threats in our community? What is causing the most damage? And then how do we address that? Um, and you know, one of the things that we've done is we've gone through and monitored our felony conviction rate. And uh, we monitor in a county area and uh, right now we are 
15 percent higher than any other county that we monitor, but that's because we set our priorities. Sure. What's causing the greatest harm to our community? And actually, that, that's the same place that my position on making OWI first criminal comes from. Okay. It, it's just threat assessments, mm -hmm. and it, it seems to be very effective so far. And we're seeing the results. We're seeing the numbers come through across the board, and it looks very good. It looks like we're starting to uh, do some good things and okay. accomplish some goals. Good. So. We're almost out of time, Christian, for, for this segment, but um, I wanted to talk to you uh, a little bit about your website. Uh, the DA's oh, yeah. office does have <coughs> a, um, a relatively new website. I mean, it's not brand spanking new, but it's 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 not been out for all that terribly long. Well, I and it's part of, for um, viewers, it's, it's part of the county's website. I, I, I think if we can... Um, uh, when our control room people have an opportunity, they can maybe put the website address up um, so that people have it for more information. But um, if they're in doubt about how to get to it, they can get to it through the county's website, which is on ionoshkosh.com. But what prompted the DA's office to have its own website? It's okay. And um, it's up you know, what, what is on there? Yeah. <laughs> oh, very nice. <laughs> I can read um, it. Hey. You know, one of the things that has always concerned me about prosecution is the general public doesn't doesn't really get an honest view from television, mm -hmm. and I don't mean shows like this. Mm -hmm. I, I mean the shows about prosecutors, mm -hmm. um, like Law and Order. Law and Order, yeah, like yeah. They, those shows bother me. They're <laughs> not based in reality. They're nothing like Scrubs. You know, Even I, reality I like shows aren't based on reality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but we we sort of operate behind the scenes, mm -hmm. and uh, you know it's interesting. Even when you look in the press, you'll see you know officers arrested this person and charged them with these things. Uh, you know, most of the general public doesn't understand. Police officers can't charge anybody with anything. Mm -hmm. Only prosecutors can. But but nobody really knows who we are or what we do. Um, and so my first thought in developing it was let's try to get a bunch of information out there so people understand who we are and what we're doing. Um, uh, you know, it, it's not that we intentionally try to operate. You know, in the dark. It's just nobody ever wants to come and watch us and quite frankly it's usually not all that exciting anyway uh, it's like watching paint dry to watch us work so it's not always that much fun but I thought if we could have a way that people could see what we we're doing um, that was what started it uh, but then as we went through that idea came about at the same time that I was drafting uh, with our deputy district attorney a set of policies and case handling guidelines and doing some threat assessments um, and I started getting a little bit leery about preparing all of these things and you know do we want the general public seeing all of this and uh, then we made the decision to you know let's put everything out there so now they can also see our uh, office policies case handling guidelines um, and we thought that that might help the general public to not only get to know who we were but uh, what it is that we're doing and why we're doing it yeah. so that they can see a little bit about it and it's it's of course impossible to explain you know, 5,500 to 6,000 cases um, per year mm -hmm. on a website, but we can at least give them an idea of why we're focusing on what we're focusing on and what we're doing. Um, so, yeah, the end result was we just, we wanted to try to put as much information out as we can, and we've just now started the process, I think, last week to uh, start working on updates to the website, and so hopefully we'll have that starting to take place a little bit more frequently. Um, we haven't updated it since we set it up. Problem is, we don't really have anybody to do this, so initially <laughs> uh, we had an intern that volunteered our time. It came into our office and followed everybody in the office around for a while. Wow. Um, learned what they did, and w we kept telling her what we wanted, um, and she put it together. Uh, she really did a lot of the drafting, and then the county IT department uh, put it up for us. So it, it was a very good break for us to mm -hmm. have uh, Lucky somebody. You. Yeah, yeah. Yep, she was interested yeah. in the criminal justice system. We wow. traded her services. She did that for us, and we sent her to court and sent her around in squad cars to go do some traffic stops and things like that. So she'll make a good employee somewhere else. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. She, she's phenomenal. Yeah. She did a great job, and mm -hmm. we're hoping to be able to put more information out there so all right excellent well christian thanks for being here well thank you we, we appreciate always it very a pleasure much. Uh, yeah welcome you're always and, well uh, informed yes always <laughs> thank well you question that we couldn't you know he couldn't answer <laughs> and all the ones we didn't ask you that's right answer. and we'll save them for the next time we will we will you're always welcome yeah thank, thank you, you so much hey. i really appreciate it yeah. all right we're going to take a real short break and when we come back uh, dan and i will be talking about the declaration of independence we'll be right back See you. <laughs> thank you
mom and dad. Well, I finally have some time off, so I'm writing to tell you that I'm doing well. We have good days and bad days over here. We try to remember the good ones and get through the bad ones. Mostly we have each other, and that's what keeps us going. And mom, since you asked, if anyone wants to help, just tell them to contact the USO. You can't believe how much they do for us. With love, your son, Michael. Every year, the U.S. Department of the Treasury receives about 1.4 million reports of problems with paper checks. Checks can be lost, stolen, or delayed. If you still receive Social Security payments by paper check, Treasury wants you to know about a safer, more convenient way to get your money. The Direct Express Prepaid Debit MasterCard. The Direct Express card is new and is available to anyone receiving Social Security benefits, even if you don't have a bank account. Your monthly benefits will be automatically placed onto your card account each month on the day your money is due. While other debit cards cost money, it is possible to use the Direct Express card for free to make purchases, pay bills, and get cash at thousands of locations nationwide. There are no sign-up or monthly account fees. No more waiting for the mail or worrying about lost or stolen checks. Call 1-877-212-9991 or visit www.usdirectexpress.com. If we were in an emergency situation, we don't have extra. We have a little bit of water and a little bit of food. A meeting no. place, no. No. I don't think we have a first aid kit. We have tuna fish, we have right. beans, we tuna. have um, um, canned beans. tomatoes, true. you know. That's true, but that's uh, really not survival food. Tomato we, paste. Yeah, well, oh, yeah. yeah. Welcome back to the second half of Ion Oshkosh, and uh, Dan is my guest this half. <laughs> well, on July 4th, 1776, Dan, as right. you well know, the uh, Declaration of Independence was adopted by our country, right. and we officially, you know, were set free from, from Britain. Right. And um, as we're taping this, you know, we're just a couple days away from the exactly. 4th of July, but as this show will air, uh, the 4th of July will have passed, right. but uh, we thought, you thought, uh, that it would be a good idea to, to talk a little bit about the Declaration of yeah. Independence, because it's not just about a day. No. It's about the way our country is right. and uh, what it means for us as, as a nation. Absolutely. And it's something that, you know, we should always think about. Um, yeah. Not just on Independence Day. Yeah. So, um, now last year, correct me if I'm wrong, but were you not somewhat instrumental last year in getting someone to read the, Decla the Declaration of Independence on the steps of the courthouse? I asked uh, Mayor Frank Tower at a council meeting, okay. and he graciously accepted. Um, there were about 15 people that showed up, but it was okay. televised by OCAD, and it was fit in as part of the, the Fourth of July celebration. Okay. And I and I feel somewhat. Uh, guilty that I didn't pursue that again this year. What I would really like is sort of a permanent thing where you wouldn't have to go every year and ask. And the history of reading the Declaration really uh, is pretty strong in this country and it really was normally done on the steps of the courthouse mm -hmm. in each county. It was done for 50, 60 years after you know we, we broke from England. And in 1975 when I was in the North Dakota legislature I introduced a resolution urging the sheriffs of all counties in North Dakota to celebrate the bicentennial, which was 1976, to read the declaration from their courthouse steps. And, and the response is overwhelming. In fact, most sheriffs said it was the most proud day that they had been sheriff of their own counties. Some also said it took them two or three days to practice the reading, which is fine. So I would like, you know, kind of have it permanent, and I, and I think I will go forward on it. Now, why do I want that? Well, I want it in part because I think July 4th has been stolen for a parade fireworks. and a fireworks. Mm -hmm. Now admittedly, it's pretty hard to get excited about reading the Declaration, but that is what the day is about. Uh, you know, it is the day that we formally announced to the world uh, that we were declaring ourselves independent from, from England. And, uh, you know, the military has kind of taken over the 4th of July. They've taken over Memorial Day. They've taken over Armistice Day. Flag Day is another day. Yeah. And so I just want a little 20 minutes, you know, on the morning of July 4th, before the parade, which is wonderful, everyone enjoys it, and before the fireworks, we might, for those of us who are interested in, in listening to the words, not speeches, just someone reading the Declaration, as Frank did mm -hmm. last year, 
to me is part of what July 4th should be about. Well, you said that you'd, you'd like to do something as a permanent fixture. Um, would you, since in North Dakota you introduced this in the state legislature where you were, right. uh, you know, an assembly person, but um, is that something that you would entertain doing on a statewide basis? I don't think or, I have the power to do that. Well, but I mean, maybe going to Gordon Hintz or, yeah. you know, someone uh, in the state right. assembly or maybe yeah. even in the state senate? I, I would be more modest. I would be tickled to death if I could get the Winnebago County Supervisors to pass a resolution uh, that inviting the sheriff or the county executive, whoever, to read the declaration mm -hmm. every mo every July 4th from the, from the courthouse. How did it come to be in North, uh, North Dakota that the sheriffs did it? Uh, that's an interesting, uh, that, an interesting that was party the That was the tradition of the colonies. Okay. That the sheriff did the I did see, that. okay. Yeah, I, it wasn't original. Okay. You know, I researched it and I found out that that was normally how it was done. One of those little tidbits about the Declaration of yeah. Independence that so, and, and I, know. you know, um, but you know, I, I think uh, I don't know. I, I guess I'm, I'm promoting patriotism in, in a less, sure. in, in a more intellectual and in a more personal, reflective sort of way, mm -hmm. rather than praise and fireworks. Sure. And so that's kind of what I would yeah. like to do. How did you become so personally interested in? I mean, this is a real passion. That is, I yeah. Can tell. Yeah. And um, how how did you come to be so interested in it? Okay, I have <coughs> traveled, uh, lived abroad, and. My standard answer to a question is, what makes Americans different than the rest of us? I quote the Declaration of Independence. Hmm. I think this one passage, which I can probably, but I'll, Jefferson wrote in the second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. To me, that is, you know, our natural rights that Jefferson selected and that is why we broke from England. Because he goes on to say that if, if governments don't do these things, then the people have a right to revolt and move forward. Mm -hmm. To me, that's really the essence of, of the American experience. Okay. Uh, that we have certain unalienable rights in this country. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, I have no idea what Jefferson meant by the pursuit of happiness. Uh, and I've read many accounts. And I, the, the best interpretation is that it's not a libertarian sort of thing. You can do whatever you want. It was pursuit of happiness in the sense that government should not interfere with your lifestyle or your pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. they, they, you know, they were getting away from a monarch, and, and, and they didn't want to. So life and liberty is, uh, is easy to understand. Pursuit of happiness is a little mm -hmm. more difficult to understand. Within reason. Within of reason. Course. Yeah, it is. Yeah, I mean, I don't you know what, you know. And, and of course, I think that's sometimes the difficult part is, is for government to know where to draw that line. Right, exactly. Because you know, it is a fine line. It between, is. Between, I mean, one person's happiness um, can easily make right. someone else right. very unhappy and disgruntled. Right. You know, and, and so exactly. trying to find no, that, that happy medium and that balance. Right. You know? and, and, and the declaration is not codified. It's, it's not, it's just sort of a preamble to the existence of our country. It's not mm -hmm. in the federal constitution. We'll talk a little bit later about why Lincoln thought it was so important. But it really is you know, it doesn't have any legal standing. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think it has tremendous historical standing. Well, let's talk about the history. Uh, let's talk about how and where it originated. Okay. Very good question. Came from the Continental Congress. Uh, Richard Horse Lee, I think, from Virginia, uh, introduced a resolution to uh, uh, have someone draft it. There was five people who were selected to the committee, but everyone turned to Jefferson including Adams and Franklin who were on the committee. And, and I think the quote was, Adams said, that Jefferson had the reputation as a masterly pen, unquote. And so they assigned it to Jefferson. Franklin looked at it, he made a few suggestions. Uh, um, Adams looked at it, but basically it was Thomas Jefferson who wrote this almost exclusively. Hmm. And it wasn't signed by the, uh, you know, the members until August. So, uh, you know, it, it, it wasn't official, I guess, on July 4th, but it was promulgated. And uh, so it came out of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, the two states that were most powerful in our early years were, was Virginia and Massachusetts. Okay. That's where our early presidents came from. Mm -hmm. That's where the Declaration is from, uh, you know, Jefferson and, and Adams. So it, it, that's where it originated. And Jefferson really deserves credit for okay. writing almost all of it. And it's, you know, you've got a copy of it yeah. here. It's, it's rather lengthy. Rather lengthy. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> and, and that's part of the argument. People say, well, gee, Rylance wants people to read this, but it's so blankety blank long. But still, you know, it's so important. It is. You know. And, you know, maybe part of the reason, too, that people have a problem with it is because it's, you know, it is long. Um, some of it, like so many other things, they're written in a way that it's difficult to sometimes understand. Yeah. You know, although that phrase, that particular section that you yeah. read is pretty easy to understand, but you know what I mean. A lot of this stuff is oh, written no, with a, a type of legalese, if you well, will. If we would, if we'd read an opinion from a district attorney or something, it would be pretty legalistic as well. Absolutely. But you're right. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure how long it would take. I don't think it would take more than 15 minutes to read this. No, probably uh, not. I mean, isn't that about what it took Frank yeah, last year? Yeah, and he read the names mm -hmm. of the signers, too. He, he, we talked before. He said, do you think I should? I said, why not? Mm -hmm. So he, he enumerated all the people who, who signed it. It was fine. Who, who did sign it? Um, well, let's, let's pick some. Um, from Virginia was George Wythe, Richard Henry Lee, who introduced the mm -hmm. resolution, Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Harrison, uh, Thomas Nelson Jr., Francis Lightfoot Lee, ah. and Carter Braxton. Uh, let's go to Massachusetts because I think in terms Samuel Adams, okay. Sons of Liberty, John Adams, who I mentioned a minute ago, yeah. Robert Treat Payne, and Eldridge Jerry were the ones that uh, were there from, I think there were like 50 some members. Obviously, Franklin from 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 uh, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. So some names that some of us have never heard of, and other names others that, that we uh, continue. That uh, we have yeah. heard of all of our lives. Yeah, and, and, they, and they continued. Uh, Robert Morris, the financier of the Revolution. Benjamin Rush, who was a doctor, a friend of Franklin. Yeah, some are known to us. And only one person signed his name with his town after it. Who was that? Charles Carroll of Carleton. Hmm. Or Carrollton, I'm sorry for. Uh, I wonder why he did that. I don't know. No, no, interesting. The only one. Every other is just, but he put his, you know, you know, Cheryl of Oshkosh. <laughs> you know. <laughs> well, the, the 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 thing is, at least you could read his. Uh, I don't think if well, I signed I couldn't my read name, mine you'd be able either. To read it. Yeah. Oh, that's. Uh, <laughs> it's gotten worse yeah. over the years. So, so what other things are are in here, Dan? What other things does it uh, well, does, it, does it talk about? Basically, after we get through this sort of philosophical thing that the Jefferson, it's just a enumeration of things that. George III, they are accusing of him. And in all fairness, he was not totally responsible. But it was just easier to, you know. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their office. He has kept us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. He has affected to render the military independence of and superior to the civil power. He has quartered large bodies of armed troops among us, put them in their homes. Uh, he cut off trade with all parts of the world. He imposed taxes on us without consent. All those things that you know, you and I learned in, in maybe college or you know, social studies in mm -hmm. high school. You know, all of these. You know, but it, Parliament was involved basically by 1776. The, con the, the, the colonies and, and the mother country have grown apart. Mm -hmm. We've been over here for a couple hundred years. Uh, we're, they're taxing us more to pay for wars in Europe that we have really no interest in. Uh, we have leaders in this country that are you know, truly outstanding. We have sort of local government here. So it's just a series of things that, that drew us apart. Sure. And probably only a third of the people in the country were for it. Mm -hmm. Maybe a third against it and a third middle could, could care less. So I mean, it was, and revolutions aren't started by a lot of people. They're started by a very few people like people who signed the Declaration of Independence. Yeah. And isn't that interesting that, that <coughs> you talk about thirds, you know, some being for, some opposed, yeah. and, and some just in the middle because they just don't care or whatever. Right. And isn't that interesting that that's kind of the way the breakdown is on so many issues, oh, absolutely. even to this day. Yeah. It oh. doesn't matter what it is, if it's no. parking tickets no. or higher taxes right. or whatever. It could be a local know. or a state or a federal issue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. you got some who are so adamantly opposed, absolutely. others who are just really pushing for it, right. and then you You've got the others who are just sort of, eh, they're very apathetic exactly. and they can take it or leave it. No, no you know. Too. So, um, is slavery addressed at all? No, in the document. Okay. Uh, there was a draft in it uh, that they blamed the king again for not stopping the slave. That poor king, he got it, yeah, didn't he? Yeah, George III was <laughs> you know, was a loser. Uh, they blamed him for not stopping the slave trade and didn't talk about. You know, abolishing slavery, but they, they blamed it. The Southern legislator people said, no way, we're not. And, and really, in all honesty, this is the great sin of, of the Founding Fathers. I, I do not understand the slavery thing. I mean, I've, I've looked at it, I've read a lot about it, but 
it just it was why didn't they see that as mm -hmm. something that was inherently you know unequal and, and uh, but they did and and it took a war of course to uh, to eliminate that but slavery was uh, was not part of freedom yeah what so what if anything is uh, you know Lincoln's relationship to okay. the Declaration okay. of Independence. And that's, a, and that's a good way to go. Uh, Lincoln was called to give a, a, a brief speech after the Battle of Gettysburg in, in Pennsylvania in November of, uh, of 1863. He came 16 days after the last day of the battle. And he delivered what most people think is sort of the companion piece to the Declaration of Independence. Uh, it was only 272 words. Uh, didn't take more than a couple minutes to read, and he followed a guy who gave a speech for two hours. Uh, they even had a uh, porta potty on the side could, <laughs> so he could go relieve himself and come back and give his speech. So it was sort of he was sort of a second headliner, if you like. But just listen to the first paragraph because this is what Lincoln does. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all men are created equal. Of course, they weren't all created because slaves were excluded. But now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived, so dedicated, can long endure. So he doesn't go to the federal constitution. And he believed that the Declaration of Independence should be a living document and the constitution should be reflective of the, of the principles and, and it should be ongoing. Like, for example, that slavery should be prohibited. Mm -hmm. And so he, he went right, right to the heart of four score and seven years ago. That was, you know, four scores, 80 years, and seven more, 87 years after the Declaration of it. That's what he wanted to make the most important point. Mm -hmm. and, and I, you know, and he, uh, he viewed that Constitution or, or the, the Declaration as the center of, of American government. And so it's kind of fitting that our 16th president uh, was able to do what the founding fathers couldn't conceive of doing, and that is to get rid of slavery. Yeah. yeah. You know, you talked about this at the very outset about how we've sort of I guess, uh, not just as individuals, but as a nation, uh, as a whole, mm -hmm. um, lost the meaning of what the day is all about, mm -hmm. like we have with so many Oh, holidays, absolutely. It's not exclusive. You know, yeah. um, I, I mean, the, we, we've, we really have lost the yeah. importance of, of what each holiday is about, I yeah. think, in so many cases. But, um, you know, we see some massive celebrations in different parts of the country. You know, the mm -hmm. the uh, Boston Pops mm -hmm. in, in Boston mm -hmm. every 4th of July. It's a terrific concert, mm -hmm. but nobody that mm -hmm. I'm aware of, um, y you know, reads the declaration mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe that would be a good way of starting off that concert, you know? It would be. And um, wouldn't it be interesting if we turned on our television on this Saturday, July 4th, and President Barack Obama was reading the Declaration of Independence? That, that would be good. Huh? That, I mean, that wouldn't would that be, be a real good. symbol of... Uh, here's yeah. our first black president mm -hmm. who's reading, you know, the Declaration of Independence. The, do you know? Is anybody planning that? I I don't think so. Uh, but yeah. I, I mean, and that's a shame yeah. because you know this presidency has so many um, historical perspectives yeah, really attached does. to it yep. that this would be a wonderful way mm -hmm. to. Um, not necessarily hallmark the presidency, mm -hmm. but but another way of setting it into history. Mm -hmm. You know. And away from partisanship, mm -hmm. something that we all should think about. Yeah. What are some ways um, that we can not only bring this back, because we've talked about ways to do that on, on the actual 4th of July, but, um, you know, ways that we can keep this in our hearts and our minds mm -hmm. um, 365 days a year? Mm -hmm. Well, education, I think, is, is, is clearly a, you know, a form to, you know, to continue to talk about this. Uh, I read somewhere where half the high school graduating seniors in the United States don't know what the First Amendment to the Constitution is. Uh, so it wouldn't be just exclusive of, of the Declaration. Mm -hmm. I, I think we really have, uh, have forgotten our heritage and forgotten some of these great documents that really are the foundation of the America that you and I live in. Why do you think that is? Uh, you know, because, well, I mean, I have my own thoughts mm -hmm. on it. I, I think that we've kind of gotten away from teaching mm -hmm. the basics mm -hmm. in schools. We've moved into other areas. But I also think, you know, some of these documents have been monkeyed around with and tweaked mm -hmm. in so many ways mm -hmm. by local courts, state courts, sure. even our U.S. Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody has their own interpretation of stuff. Mm -hmm. and And I think it kind of sometimes makes it hard to stay on top of this mm -hmm. 
instead we should just get back to the very basics mm -hmm. of what these documents say. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that in, its, in its most simplistic, pure mm -hmm. form seems to be the mm -hmm. best way to go. I think that's go. a great idea, yeah. You know? I think we're a very busy society. Um, you know, holidays are, are not days to celebrate our heritage. They're days to be with your family mm -hmm. and get a rest from work. And, and three-day weekends, we love them because we don't, like other countries, we don't have many of them. Yeah. Canadians have one a month, uh, three days. And, uh, and so it's, it's other priorities, I guess, yeah. take place. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, w it wouldn't be that difficult to do that. It would be fun to uh, uh, have maybe uh, it read at uh, other occasions. But for me, it's, it's just a personal thing. I would like to see the Declaration of Independence read on July 4th each year somewhere in Oshkosh. Well, let's, let's get a movement going to, yeah. to have that done here. Yeah. You know, I think that, that yeah. would be a good idea. And I appreciate you having given me the opportunity to talk about it. Sure. Well, we've got just a couple minutes yeah. left. Um, any other thoughts uh, on this or how we can um, remember it? Um, not just on the 4th, but other days as well? or Well... Because otherwise we can chat about a couple of other you things. You know, I, I suspect that <coughs> OCAT could put a text of the Declaration of Independence mm -hmm. on television. Good idea. Uh, I, you know, that could run, I think, by itself. Mm -hmm. um, that would be one thing. Some newspapers, our newspaper, the one I used to work for, we always published it on, on July 4th. I don't know whether the... Mm -hmm. it, it, again, it's kind of long. But another, another thing would be for a newspaper to reserve their op-ed page or their editorial page on July 4th and reprint the Declaration of Independence. That would be another easy way to you know, disseminate it. Hmm. Um, I don't know. Um, maybe, a, I hate to say let's have a discussion of it because then you would get into the things that you just mentioned that people will pick this or pick that. I, it shouldn't be a public or political debate. It should be just the words. Something to be cherished. Yeah, exactly. You know. Yeah. Uh, maybe the library could have a, uh, a display uh, on the Declaration of Independence as part of the July 4th celebration. That might be another thing that they might mm -hmm. be able to do. But okay. certainly that with the media, uh, television, newspaper, uh, we certainly could, you know, promote the text, mm -hmm. which is really what you know. Absolutely. But the drama of having someone come out on the courthouse steps, you know, uh, you know, does add a little bit of theatrics to it that you wouldn't get on television or on the newspaper. Absolutely. You know, yeah. And I think once people take your young children to it, you know, we're going to listen to the Declaration of Independence this morning. And, you know, your child might say, well, what's that? Well, that's kind of, that's where we're going to go listen. We'll talk. Mm -hmm. about, I think it would be a great learning experience for families. Well, and, and again, something that a family can do together. Absolutely. You know, we're always, yeah. and I know some people, you know, watching this might think that's kind of hokey, kind of yeah. sappy or yeah. whatever, but, you know, we need to get back to some of these basics yeah. in our society yeah. as a whole yeah. and get away from some of the stuff that uh, some folks are are involved in. Yeah. And I don't want to discount you know. either the parade or the fourth of, or no, the fire. No, of course not. This is just sort of a, this is the beginning of, of the ceremony of the day. Mm -hmm. Sure. Yeah. And, and I think it would be the proper thing to do. Yeah. So, Well, good. Thanks, Dan. Hey, happy 4th of July. Happy 4th of <laughs> July to you. Uh, I was going to say posthumously, but, well, I guess in some respects, since we don't read this, yeah. maybe that is a, a good thing yeah. But uh, yeah. or, or the proper word to yeah. say. But, but thank you for anyway. letting me talk about it. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you for sharing your, yeah. your knowledge mm -hmm. and your passion with us. So, Anyway, thank you uh, for joining us as always. Thanks to the crew, and uh, we will see you next time. Until then, take good care. Keep your eye on us. We've got All Right on Oshkosh.